I'm just sitting there on the front row, just overwhelmed with gratitude at the Lord. I, uh, like, really? No, like, I'm sitting there thinking, you're the best, God. <laughs> He's the best. We have the best story. We have the best redemption. We have the best promises, the best inheritance. I mean, everything it, that he is and that he gives is the best. And I was just, in my, in my heart, I was just thinking about how I, just, I was just overwhelmed with that, that line. He says, as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. A hundred billion failures. That's true. Take every human being, 8 billion on the planet-ish now, whatever it is, 7, 8 billion, 20 billion forever, and then every one of our failures, 100 billion is not even the right number. It's too small. And he sends Jesus, and all of them are, are expunged by the power of the blood of Jesus. And now I, he's invited us into love to invite others to be reconciled to God. And I was just thinking about even my life. I'll just, can I just testify for a second before I preach? Like, you know, I remember when my dad told me, he said, you were born gray. You had been choked by the umbilical cord and you came out and you were just a limp body with, and your chest was deflated. And they had to work on you until life came into you. And I just think of myself and I think, man, it, you know, it shouldn't have happened, but, but God. And then I think about, like, my testimony. Like, I, I was messed up. I was a messed up kid. I was into drugs and alcohol. And, and man, you, you, you know, I, I shouldn't have become a preacher, but, but God. <laughs> Because I'm the last guy you would have ever thought of. And, and then I was thinking about just the number of times he delivered me. I mean, I, I've walked away from multiple total loss car accidents without a scratch. It shouldn't have happened, but God. And then in ministry, just, just all of these things that the Lord has done. Like I remember when... They said, hey, uh, so you want to plan a 24-7 worship and prayer? I go, yeah, that, that never will happen. No one else has ever done it. And, and, I, and I got the picture that after we went 24-7, like, wow, this should not have happened. But God. <laughs> and then I'm sitting here, and it, I mean, the room is so full of joy this morning. Like, the worship is so sweet. And the sense of just the love of God is so rich in here. And I'm like, we just, I mean, we completely went off the map from any church growth strategy. Any how to build your local church. Like, we completely went, okay, we're going to take that, throw that in the garbage, and let's just go a completely off the map direction. And you get it, right? We're a year into this thing. And there's life, and there's joy, and people's lives are being changed. And, and, and it shouldn't have happened, but God. The only, the only reason any of us are here is the grace of God. And, and I'm, just, I'm just, seriously, this is not a show. I am not like trying to perform for you. I'm telling you, I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of our God this morning. I'm so filled with joy. And listen, you really, you can have that. You really can. I, I've been into this thing over 30 years where, man, I've been going after Jesus, loving Jesus, serving Jesus as my main thing. And it's not getting old for me. It's getting better. Because he, he's infinite. And so, I mean, I take you know, 30 years journey into him, I'm 30 years deeper into him and not one inch closer to exhausting him. Yeah. And it's better and better and better. And I, I just, man, I'm just thankful. 
I should have been dead. <laughs> but he gave me life. I, I was a total failure and a bust. <laughs> you know? I mean, Jeff and I were looking. I just, can, we just, can we just have coffee for a minute? <laughs> I just said, man, I love these folks from Good Landing. I, during worship. Oh, I, I love you guys. Because you're screaming at 9 a.m. Yeah! Why are you screaming at 9 a.m.? You're screaming at 9 a.m. Here's why. Because your heart has been hungry for something for so long. And finally, you're getting a little drop of what you like your heart's been desiring for so long. And you're realizing, this is what I was made for purity and beauty and love and fire. I was made for this. And I just, you know, I, I said to Jeff, I go, I love people who have struggled with drugs and alcohol. I go, well, I guess that means I love me and you too. Because all it is, is just a little misaimed passion. That's all it is. I'm so appreciative of God's ability to rescue the unrescuable. I mean, who's in your life this morning and you think that person is not a chance? I mean, do you have anybody in your life this morning like that? They are completely within the ability of God and within the, the grasp of the grace of God. Let's just do this. If you have someone that, you, that is just on, it's, they're just on the outskirts. Maybe it's a prodigal. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a coworker, or a family member. I mean, the hardest person you can think of that's just on the outskirts. I want to pray for them all right now. Let's just stand. If you've got somebody like that, just, let's just stand. I mean, let's all stand. But if you've got somebody like that, let's just hold them before the Lord. Somebody's like, oh, he's going off the script. No, I'm not. We don't have a script. Huh? <laughs> I, I, I want you to just begin to lift that person up right now. You just begin to call their name. You just begin to say their name before the throne. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we lift up everyone who, who seems to be so far gone that there's just not a human remedy to their situation. God, the backslidden, the prodigal, the obstinate, the rebel, the atheist, oh, you love atheists because you love to show them your grandeur. So Father, we lift them all up right now. And we ask you by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would reach in and release conviction on their soul. When they lay their head on the bed tonight, when they put their head on the pillow tonight, let them have an awakening moment. Let them have a sense. There's so much more than, than what they've been thinking. God, I pray, let that, that one verse, that one Bible verse, that one sentence that that witness gave them, that one time, that one billboard they saw, that one track that they read, that one song that they heard, let it begin to just go on repeat in their mind. Let it just begin to go on repeat. Because there is no one beyond your arm. Your arm is not too short that it cannot save. And so we ask you right now for all the prodigals, all the distant ones, all the obstinate ones, all the rebellious ones, all the lost ones, everyone that's on any of our minds whose names we've said out of our mouths, say their name. Father, we thank you for that right now, reaching them by your spirit. We believe in the name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed with that said amen. amen. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a great hand clap. We believe. We believe and we thank you for it. Our good God, you are fantastic. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Well, I'm going to preach uh, kind of a part two from... What I started a couple weeks ago, identity and sonship, I, I'll just tell you right now, I've got way too many notes for the time that we have, so I'm going to do it again next week. Praise God. We're just going to stay on this theme. But I, I want to talk about our identity, talk specifically about how we view ourselves in light of how we view God, and, and really just drill down on this thing, because I know we've been talking a lot about the father heart of God and sonship and 
and that we're heirs of God. And I realize that, you know, you can fully agree with all that in the mind, but you can have, you know, areas in your heart that are disabling you to be able to believe. You're, it's disabling faith because of areas in our own souls. And, and I want to just work through some of this so that we can actually get to the place where we're receiving the truth of our identity, where we're walking in the truth of our identity. And, uh, and so I, I just want to talk about identity for a few moments. I'm going to get to Ephesians 1 here in a second if, we, if, if, if I can. I'm, I'm going to do my best. But I want to talk about our identity. Listen, every single person in here, we live from the place of our identity. Every person does. However you view yourself is how you live. What you think about yourself dictates your actions. And what you think about yourself is dictated by the way you view God. A.W. Tozer said this, the most important thing about any of us is what we think about God. Because what we think about God determines how we therefore live. Amen. And so, and so this issue of our identity is drawn directly from our image of God. And, and here's what I found. Uh, you know, many, many people, they love the idea of Jesus as Savior on the cross. They love that idea. They love the idea of, of Jesus as a bridegroom. Who, you know, we're going to the marriage supper of the lamb. They love the lamb slain, and they're, they're like, okay, I'm fully in on that. But I found this over years of ministry, that once I start begin uh, talking about God the Father, oftentimes there is this like blank disconnect that happens with people. It's like they just, their eyes just glaze over, and they just, uh-huh, mm-hmm. And, and what I realize is this, that in this generation, and in this generation is zero to 125, that equals this generation, uh, that we probably have the most fractured experience of family and of, uh, of familiar relationships of any other American generation. And so what happens is because of the breakdown in the home and the breakdown of the parental relationships, the breakdown specifically of the father relationship, our internal image of God ends up being dictated to by our experience with our father and father figures. Am I making sense? And so what happens is if I say father in this room, and I say I passed out paper and said, hey, write down what a father is. And, 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 and everybody put their own definition in. I would get as many definitions as there are people in the room. And it's because of this fracturing in the family and this fracturing in those familiar relationships, particularly the father-child relationship. And, and why? Why is there a fracturing of that relationship? Because the enemy knows that our image of God is dictated to us by how we engage with father. Because God is a father. And so if the enemy can attack that relationship, what he, 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 I mean, he wants to break that thing down, twist it and pervert it. If he can attack that thing, then he can pervert and twist our image of God. And so some people, they think, well, man, I've, got a, I've, got a, I've had a bad history you know, with fathers and father figures. My father's ter you know, terrible situation. And, and they go, so I can never know the heart of the father. And I would say, no, 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 no. You can totally know the heart of the father because of that old way that we used to develop film. Remember they used to take the film to the store and you'd get the pictures back a week later. I can remember going through that drive through with my mom as a kid and like you get the picture back and like three of them have the finger over the thing. You're like, oh, I wanted that. But in that little envelope, you had the pictures and then you had the film components and those film components are called negatives. And the negatives were what they derived the full color image from. And so if you have a negative image of father, you can still derive a full color image of what God the father is really like. Because you can just 
do it in opposite. Oh, he's not like this. He's not a liar. He's not angry. Oh, he doesn't lose his temper with me. Oh, oh, he's the opposite. He's kind. He's merciful. He's gentle. He's faithful. He's present. He's truthful. Oh, that's who you are? And a negative can be just as powerful as a positive image. Amen. And so what I want to deal with is this, is that so often because of these, this internal image of God has been disfigured, we end up uh, having like a real challenge relating to God the Father. And, and, and so what we don't realize we've done many times is we project upon God that internal image. And so if there's a brokenness there, if there's an, a, a, a negative there, oftentimes we ascribe the negative to God. And, and that's what I want to deal with right now, is dealing with the negative image that we project on God. The negative image in our heart that we project on God. When we have that negative image, we exchange the truth of who God is as a kind, loving Father who's caring who, 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 who always takes care, who's always there, who's always present, who's mostly glad, mostly happy, and we, we insert all the other negatives and we think that's who he is. And, and I'm just gonna tell you, that's not who God is. And, and, and so when we've projected those negative images on God, that's called an orphan mentality, Okay? Because we're not living in our identity as sons and daughters. We're living with an identity derived from a father that we have projected upon God. We're saying, you're not good. You're not kind. You're not loving. You don't care. Thus, we are not your heir. We don't have an inheritance in you. Am I making sense? So, here's what happens. When someone has hurt from a father and a fa- or a father figure, because it, be, it could be either, the progression can look like this. Just, just track this. Oftentimes, because this thing roots in us over time in different ways, but oftentimes the progression looks like this. It starts off with a fear of submission to authority or authority figures. <laughs> Think about when I was younger, they're like, I think you're a little rebellious. I'm not rebellious. I just think I'm always right. And I don't want to do what you said. That's called rebellion. <laughs> Fear of submission to authority or authority figures. Sometimes it's just an aloofness toward particularly male authorities. I'm asking you now to take a little bit of an inventory. Fear of submission... <laughs> Fear of submission to authority or authority figures, sometimes aloofness towards male authority. What happens is this results in a closed spirit. You close your heart down and you become the protector of your own heart. And what happens is when you close your heart like this and you don't trust, you actually unintentionally close your heart toward God. And so when you have that closed heart, what happens is it leads to this unhealthy independence. You think, you know, it, you've got to do things yourself. You've got to rely on yourself. You've got to trust only in yourself. And, and, and the reason why is you're, you're afraid that others are going to let you down no matter what. And, and oftentimes what people will do is they will short circuit another person's good intentions to prove that that person will reject them. Because of this closed, unsubmitted spirit independent spirit and that independent spirit it causes us to deny the pain in our own heart and hide that pain we don't want people to know our weaknesses and we're afraid of being vulnerable and we don't want to be exposed as weak and in my experience the vast majority of the church not just to this place I'm saying the church operates like this we don't want anyone to know our weaknesses and we don't want people to know we're vulnerable because we're afraid of being exposed as weak, except the Bible is full of examples of all these patriarchs that we look up to and their weaknesses are on display. We were talking about before service how Paul, he says, if I'm gonna boast in anything, I'm gonna boast in my weakness. 
And so there's this complete flip of how we interact in church. And and it shows up in just the most weird ways because it's all covered in Christianese. How are you doing today, brother? Blessed. How are you doing? Blessed. Glory to God. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And nobody's blessed. Everybody's faking it. And there is no fake it till you make it in the kingdom of God. What you do is you fake it until God attacks that fake stuff and breaks it down till you finally get honest. And and if I can just say it this way, you can't even really get saved unless you're willing to be honest. As long as you're saying, I don't need anybody, I don't need anything, I'm good, I've got it, I've got it all taken to get, uh, I've got it all together, uh, and, and everything I need, I've got myself, then, then you don't need a savior, do you? So you have to come to reality to even get saved. And what I always wonder about is how do we come to reality and vulnerability and say, I need Jesus? Even to the extent of walking up in front of crowds of people that we don't even know, God, I need Jesus. And then that translates into living among ourselves in the church with praise God. How does it translate to this fake covering, always trying to show our strength instead of our weakness? What is that? That's an orphan mentality. Because we don't want to act like children we want to act like we got it together i've had the honor of counseling i don't know i don't know how many weddings i've done a bunch like 40 or 50 right and i get to do premarital counseling with these couples and you know the the couples in in this generation the couples that get married at 28 29 they tend to have a little bit more on the ball than the 20 21 year old But I've had a few of those where the 20, 21-year-old sits in front of me and they want to act like they know everything. Yeah, that was never anybody in this room. But I I just sit there and I look at them and I go, how's it going? Praise God, we've got it all together. (laughs) The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And I go, really? Yeah. And then you try to share a few. They go, yeah, yeah, the Lord showed us that. Oh, yeah, the Lord showed us that too. Oh, I know, praise God. I'm going, wow, it took me 25 years of hard knocks in marriage to get that point. I was actually giving you like some of the gold refined in the fire right there, but you already got it at 21. Good for you. (laughs) And that I know, praise God, we got it together. It melts into, dear God, can you help me six months later? Don't laugh too much. <laughs> I know, when it hits close to home, you're like, oh, ha, ha. I mean, I, I know. So we're afraid of being vulnerable. We're afraid of showing our weakness. And so what we tend to do as a result is we control our relationships. We control our relationships with anger or aggression or on the other end of the spectrum, passivity or isolation. Nobody is allowed to get in, and if you start hitting close to home, I'm either going to freak out on you or I'm going to isolate myself from you. And so we shield ourselves from intimacy because we don't want to be hurt and we don't want to be exposed. This is an orphan mentality that I'm explaining. When we live like this, we live superficially in our relationships with others. A lot of people may know us, but nobody really knows us. You end up being the most isolated, lonely person, even in groups of people that all know you and know all about you, but they don't know you. And even in friends and family, you can feel completely alone. See, an orphan mentality, what it does is it hides itself, it builds a barrier around itself, it protects itself, Because an orphan doesn't believe it has a father and an inheritance. It doesn't believe it has a protector and a caregiver and and a provider. It believes I've got to take care of myself. And so I will at all costs fight for me. At all costs. And so this thing manifests in finding counterfeit affections. Uh, people, they, they, they fight for themselves, and, and what do they do? They, they go after things that will bolster self, and, and so they, they find security in possessions, money. They, 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 they find, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, affection and passions. They, 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 do, they do addictions and compulsions. And, and, and sometimes it's alcohol and drugs. Sometimes it's food. Sometimes it's immorality. Sometimes it's just stuff. Just give me things to, to fill this place of, of desire. Oftentimes they find acceptance in position. They strive to be seen or to attain the praise of men. Many times it's just in power. Let me be in control. I have to be in control. It's funny how often I talk to people and as soon as the control button is pressed, well, I can't do that because I, you know, I wouldn't be in control. I go, ooh, ow. As soon as that control button is pre pressed, that whole thing just begins to unravel because the whole life is built on I have to control everything around me because I have to take care of this. And that's an orphan mentality. An orphan mentality has a hard time receiving love, acceptance, admonition. It results with living with an emphasis on performance as a means to receiving approval and acceptance. And I would say this is pretty much where the rubber meets the road for most people. Because there's such an emphasis in America on achievement, there's such an emphasis in America on success, on working to get ahead, on becoming something, on being a person that others can admire. There's such an, ex uh, an emphasis on, on performing for love. And what we do not realize is we do not have to perform for our Father at all. And he loves us ever still. In fact, his love isn't contingent upon our performance. You could fail gloriously. You could succeed according to men's uh, measures gloriously. And it wouldn't move God's love meter not one inch at all towards you. Because he doesn't love you based on your performance. He doesn't love you based on your performance. Somebody goes, no, no, no. You're saying, if, what if I sin? Yes. If you sin, guess what? God loves you exactly the same. He loves you exactly the same. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He did that, uh, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. Performance, even sin, doesn't move the heart of the Father in a negative way. Now, he doesn't love the action of sin. He wants you to get that out of the way. Why? Because sin separates us from God. But his heart, burning in love and acceptance for you, is not moved at all by your performance. And that right there, beloved, is so hard for us to swallow. Because a performance, performance mentality just does this. It just does the math this way. It thinks, if I do well, God loves me. And if I do poorly, I have to do something to get back into his good graces. If I do poorly, I'm sort of in the doghouse with God. And that's just not true. It's just not true. That's not who God is. That's something we projected upon God that we got from earthly fathers and father figures that is not true of his nature. He loves us ever still. In our weakness, he loves us. In our failure, he loves us. I said this to the team before the service. I said, I want to say something radical to you. And it's so elementary, but it's so radical. I go, what if life is not about success? What if it's about love? Just let that, let that rest on you. What if it's not about success? What if it's about love? That means this, that God may offer you up a massive portion of failure if he knows it will get you to love. Because love is success, not human success is success. What? And I'm sure life is about love. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it's not about any human measures of success. I'm sure it's not about ascending the corporate ladder. I'm sure it's not about the size of the house or the car or whatever, 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 the numbers in the 401k. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure it's not about that. I'm sure it's about this. If, you, if I bump into you, what comes out of you? If I bump into you, what, what comes out of you? Do I, get, do I get love if I bump into you? What if I bump into you really hard? 
how hard do I have to bump before it's not love? Or if I bump into you, do I get success? What good does it do me because the grass withers and the flowers fade away? See, there's something eternal that God wants us to receive and something eternal that he wants us to give. And it's not about any human measures. It's about an eternal measure. How did you learn to love? I ran into somebody recently and I don't know this person, this is an acquaintance, I, and, I, and, I, and it was one of those things where I, I, when I connected with them, I realized, oh, God has some things for this person. I began to speak into their life just prophetically, just gave them a thought or two, and, and I said, hey, if I can help you, just let me know. And, and, and so then I met with them, and, and they just said this. They said, I don't understand why you're doing this. I go, well, love. And they go, but you don't know me. You can't love me. I go, well, this life is about love. It's not about if I know you and you measure up to what I like, then I love you. And that's not what love is. It's not based on my knowledge of you. Love is based on the fact that that's what we're all made for because that's how God made us. Love is based on the, on the evidence of who our God is and he is at the very core. The center of his glory is love. And the manifestation of his glory is love. And me glorifying God is accepting his love and releasing his love. So that when humans who are fallen by nature, who hated God, get so, so redeemed, so saved, so delivered, so filled with God, that you bump into them and love comes out instead of hatred and vitriol, that's the glory of God. That's the glory of God. That's the kingdom come. And so this issue of performance, working to get acceptance, working to get affirmation, working to get affection, huge sign that we're living in an orphan mentality. So how do we combat this thing? The orphan mentality isn't something you cast out because it's something that's formed in the mind through an ungodly belief system. It's something that has to be changed and renewed and completely replaced with a revelation of who the Father really is. And the only way that happens is by meditating on the truth of what God says about himself. And this is why I always encourage people, make it a habit to study the emotions of God. Because once you study his emotions, the way he thinks and feels, it will change your emotions. It'll change your image of him, and then it'll change your image of yourself. This is how it works. And so coming to grips with the fact that the Lord says stuff like, behold the saints on the earth, the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. In whom is all my delight. I'm like, didn't, you meant to qualify that, didn't you? The, the saints that do right all the time, didn't isn't that what you meant? That you're delighted in the ones that perform well? He goes, no. Behold the saints, the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. I go, did you mean to say all? He goes, yes, all of it. See, the father in creation, he didn't want more planets. He didn't want more solar systems or galaxies. He didn't want an alternate universe. He wanted you. He wanted you. See, if you could just catch this point, God doesn't start with time so that he can make a universe. God starts with time so he can get to you. Time, he puts a universe inside, he puts galaxies in the universe, some hundred billion potentially. He puts solar systems in the galaxies. 
He puts our solar system in our galaxy. He puts our planet in our solar system with our ecosystem, our atmosphere, in the exact degrees it has to be from our sun so that it can actually hold life. Why? So he can put Adam on it. Why does he want Adam? Because he's a father who wants a family. And he puts Adam on it because Ephesians 1 tells us this, that before the foundations of the earth, he chose you. Now deal with it. Deal with this. Before the foundations of the earth, he chose you and predestined you for adoption. What am I telling you? I'm telling you this, that in the eternal heart of God, the Father wanted a family, and he did time and a universe and galaxies and a solar system and our solar system and our planet and our atmosphere. Why? Because he wanted you. He wanted you. What do you think this is about? I guarantee you it's not about getting another digit on your 401k. I guarantee you it's not about that. If you get a bunch of digits on your 401k, awesome. Use them for the love of God. Use them for the glory of God. Like, like it's, it's an opportunity to love. Because this place is about love. That's why he made you. Because he's loved you from forever. He uses wild language. I have loved you with an everlasting love from forever to forever and you can't change that when I begin to think about what he says about himself and how he has affections for me and, 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 and what this whole story is about, that the father actually wanted me, no wonder I came out gray, but somehow I breathed. No wonder I walked away from those car wrecks somehow. No wonder it shouldn't have happened, but God, why? Because love, it actually does win. <laughs> it actually wins. And I love saying this because... You can't lose with him. You cannot lose with him. Some of you, you're living your life trying to earn God's affection again and earn God's approval again, and what you don't realize is you never lost it. You think you zigged when you should have zagged, and that was 25 years ago, and now it's just irreparable. And I'm telling you, you never lost his affection. His purposes for you are myriad, but none of those things that we get to do with him outweigh who we are with him. Because who we are with him is we're his kids. He's a father who loves us. And this is the key thought that our identity must come from the heart of the father who loves us without exception. He loves us without regard to performance. He loves us because he loves us. <laughs> I got to read this passage in Ephesians 1. We're just starting to get there. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3, I love this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I'm just going to go through this just for a few minutes. I, it, you know, this, it starts with this, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love where Paul's going. He goes, I'm, I'm talking to you about the heart of the Father. Dial into that. 
Paul's so intentional. N- never imagine that the, the, the writing is just like, well, that's just a label, whatever, who knows. No, no, he's dialing in on the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ so we can come to know who the Father is. And then he says this, he goes, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And I would just tell you, for years I read that and go, okay, cool, heavenly, spiritual blessings, heavenly places, that's fine. I need an earthly blessing. I need a natural blessing in an earthly place. And so that Ephesians 1, 3 is like doing me no good right now when my bills aren't paid. And, and I think this is one of our huge challenges is that we live looking for natural blessings in earthly places and discounting our spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And the reason why is our identities are much more naturally tied to this place than they are to that place. And because our identities are so out of whack, we miss the very foundational truths that actually enable us to live alive in this place. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places can only enable me to live, I mean, thriving in this very natural place. Every spiritual blessing In the heavenly places, and I go, wow, Paul, that is huge. That's huge language. What are you trying to say? He goes, I'm glad you asked, because he's going to break down for some of those spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That's the very, very next thing he does. He says, he chose us. He chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world. Just what I was saying a few moments ago. That whole picture of, of what creation even even became was as a result of God's choice of you and I. The idea that in the eternal mind, the eternal heart of God, before he ever envisioned one, you know, super, supernova, one, you know, giant star, before he ever envisioned one, you know, mighty waterfall or a beautiful mountain range, before he ever envisioned any of that, that was all products of something else that he chose you and I. You know how we look at nature and the grandeur of it makes us, (gasps) wow. Do you think it blows God away? (laughs) The Bible tells us that he has to humble himself to look at his creation. (laughs) So he made it actually way beneath himself, and it's actually way above us. Because creation declares the glory of God. So the, (gasps) oh! that we get at the waterfall or the Grand Canyon or the, so, uh, the solar system or the whatever, the wow that we get at that was for one reason and one reason only, for us to see God in it. I, I often think about how he wove us together, the fact that I get to see the way I can and the distance and the colors that I'm able to perceive. And you know, you can get along in this life. You could probably get along on like, you know, 256 colors, like back in the old days, they had this, <laughs> the monitors is like 256 colors. But you know, we got 14 billion or something happening coming out of our eyes. But I'm just telling you, why would you need 14 billion colors? <laughs> you could get along on 256. I'm convinced the reason he gave us 14 billion is so we can see him. We're completely constructed to experience everything that will ultimately speak of him. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you. He thought of you before time began. Time is a product of his love for you. Just think that through for a minute. Time is a product of his love for you. The universe is a product of his love for you. How important are you? How valuable are you? Do you know who you are? Before the foundations of the world, he chose you. That you be holy and without blame before him in love. I love this phrase. I've got to end this quickly. That we would be holy and without blame. Somebody goes, see, I knew it right there. He wants to put a straight jacket on me. He wants to make me keep all his rules. I knew it. I knew God was a police officer, a traffic cop. I knew it. God bless all our police officers. We love you. The point isn't to be negative on police officers. The point is, 
God wants you to be holy because guess what he is? Holy. And the reason he wants you to be holy is so that you can be before him. That you would be holy and without blame before him. So his perfection, his beauty, holiness itself is beauty. His perfection personified, his beauty, uh, you know, manifest. And so beauty manifests in its most pure state is called holiness. So what he does is he says, I want to take of who I am, clothe you with it. It's the ultimate rags to riches story. He goes, I want to clothe you with it. And here's what I want to do. I want to do something to your soul, which is called justification. I want to delete and erase every single act of rebellion and sin from you by my son's blood so that you can stand before me clothed in beauty and perfection, blameless. Blameless. Consider it. God walks in the room, eyes of fire, face like the sun, staring. His eyes look and lock with yours. He's looking you in the eye. And you're able to stand there in pure acceptance without any shame, without any blame. This is God's desire for you. Not that he would walk in the room, lock eyes with you, and you go, oh, I did it all wrong. I'm so sorry. No, that's not the point. He wants you to be able to look him in the face blameless before him in love he didn't make you to live you, for you to live at a distance he made you to be before him without shame without blame experience the fullness of his beauty majesty and in love this is what it means to come out of being an orphan and come in to the acceptance and the identity of sonship. I have so much more to say, but we're done. All right, let's stand. We, we have got to get this in our souls. This has got to transform our identities because we're made to live fully, adopted, fully accepted in the beloved. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, where an orphan mentality has rooted itself in our minds, where a performance mentality has taken grip and rooted itself in how we live, I'm asking you right now, you would take aim. That you would so highlight the mentalities that are not worthy of you, that are not like you, that we project upon you. And you would speak your love to us again and again and again and again. You made us, not so that we would earn anything from you. You made us so that we could be before you, holy, blameless, in love. This is always your desire. This is always your plan. The son wants a bride. The father wants a family. And this is who we are. You've put your spirit in our hearts by which we cry out, Abba. 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 You're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus, dislodge orphan mentalities dislodge performance mentalities and cause your love to abound still more and more. Pour over us with the richness of revelation of your love and your acceptance. Do it in us, we ask, Abba. We love you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen, amen, and amen.